Beginning in December 1978, an Italian private security guard named Piero Fortunato Zanfretta had a series of bizarre experiences with tall green giants that rank among the most fantastic stories of all UFO contactees. Important elements of Zanfretta's account were confirmed by physical evidence and corroborating witnesses, and the unfolding drama was thoroughly documented in Italian media. Zanfretta's dramatic story exemplifies many common features of UFO contact narratives and serves as a vivid testament to their wholly alien nature. Fortunato Zanfretta was 26 and working as a security guard at a private security company, Balbizano, at the time of his first experience. On the night of December 6, 1978, he was making his usual rounds in the village of Marzano. Around 11.30 p.m., Zanfretta pulled up to a private villa when his car suddenly stopped and lost all electrical function. He then noticed that the gate and villa door were wide open, and that there were four moving lights on the lawn. He drew his weapon and ran just inside the open door to the villa. Expecting to ambush a group of thieves, he received an unexpected push from behind. Zanfretta spun around to see a monstrous being with wrinkly green skin, triangular yellow eyes, and three horns on each side of its head. Its mouth was covered in a metal strip, flesh piled up around its neck like gills, its forehead was covered in red veins, and its fingers ended in long nails with rounded tips. Zanfretta claimed that it stood no less than three meters tall. Terrified, the guard sprinted across the lawn, then felt an intense light at his back and turned around to see a large, flat, triangular craft ascending from behind the villa. The object was covered in blindingly bright multicolored lights and made a hissing noise as it rose. He later estimated it to be 30 meters wide. Two guards were dispatched to the scene and found Zanfretta face down on the lawn. Though it was cold out, his clothes were warm and dry. Zanfretta was hysterical when he awoke and had to be forcibly disarmed. In the spot where he'd been lying, there was a distinct semicircular impression, three meters in diameter, 15 centimeters thick, and pressed three centimeters deep. The story reached the papers on December 8th. Most dismissed it as a hoax, but Rino Di Stefano, a journalist at the Corriere Mercantile, a Genoese paper, took a personal interest and visited the site that afternoon. Di Stefano confirmed the presence of the semicircular indentation, and the Carabinieri, the Italian military police, found at least 52 witnesses to lights over Marzano that night. Another two-meter semicircular imprint appeared where one of these lights was seen. The next day, Di Stefano spoke with Zanfretta and interviewed all the other personnel involved. He then arranged to have Dr. Mauro Moretti, a well-esteemed hypnosis specialist, perform regressive hypnosis on Zanfretta. In the session, Zanfretta narrated details of the encounter that he could not consciously recall. The being commanded Zanfretta to come with him and placed a helmet over his head that he later claimed was used to translate the entity's speech. Zanfretta was then lifted up to a bright, warm room where he was interrogated and examined. The beings told him that they were from the third galaxy, and that they'd return soon in greater numbers. After this, Zanfretta somehow escaped or was freed, then resumed his conscious recollection of running across the villa grounds. Zanfretta was back on duty on the night of December 26, 1979, when the beings returned. Around 11.46, he was driving his car towards a tunnel near the village of Rossi, when it became surrounded by a thick fog and began driving itself. He made a frantic call to the operations center, lost reception, then called back in a calm, obedient tone, and said his car had stopped itself before a great light he felt compelled to approach. The rescue team found Zanfretta's car on the side of the road with its headlights on. Zanfretta leapt out of a nearby ravine, running for his life, and the guards had to wrestle him back to his senses. Again, his clothes were warm and dry, despite the cold, rainy weather, and his head was extremely hot from the nose up. Zanfretta's car was burning hot inside and out, particularly on the roof. Later, Zanfretta recalled an intense light beaming down from above. 
As the guards were driving away, their car died on the road, before starting up again a hundred meters ahead. Semfreda said that they were still there, watching. Still, he remembered nothing about his encounter that night, and could not explain how six bullets went missing from his pistol. After searching the scene, the Carabinieri found huge footprints in the mud measuring 50 by 20 centimeters. On the side of the road there was a semicircle of uprooted vegetation 3 meters in diameter, and long treadless skid marks in the ground. Simfreda became a national celebrity, but also the subject of tremendous skepticism. To clear his name, Semfreda agreed to a televised hypnosis session with Dr. Moretti. Under hypnosis, he recalled meeting one of the beings who took his gun and fired six oddly silent shots before Zemfreda was lifted up in a green beam of light. The guard then found himself in a room surrounded by dashboards and controls that looked much larger than the craft did from outside. There were ten or more of the tall beings there, and one of them put a helmet on his head that shocked him when he resisted. They stripped his clothes, covered his eyes, and passed a cold object over his chest. They told him that they needed human beings as guinea pigs, and that they'd come back when he least expected it. Senfreda retold his story on Pentatol, a truth serum, under the guide of Dr. Marco Marchesan, expanding on the same narrative he told under hypnosis. He claimed that the being's prince, who identified himself as Almach, said that his people, the Dargos, had traveled 4,000 light years in order to make friends with humans and see how they're made. The Dargos were destined to die in a planetary explosion and needed a place to start over, so they were going to build a domed city on Earth. They also warned of the dangers of atomic bombs. Almach's eyes contained a thousand forming colors that Zemfreda found difficult to look at. The beings then introduced Semfreda to a strange object that would soon become the focal point of their interactions. A clear crystal-like sphere that contained a golden pyramid with lights at its corners and strange symbols on its surfaces. They told Semfreda that this sphere acted like a kind of TV to show them how the aliens lived. After this, Semfreda was beamed back down to Earth. The Dargos also claimed to have entered the villa at Marzano and taken some animals they thought were alive. The Carabinieri confirmed that the door to the villa had been violently torn from the wall, and that two stuffed birds had been taken. The Zemfreda story had gone international after an article Di Stefano published on January 20th, and his story on the Pentatol session did a lot to convince the world that the guard was being honest in his retellings. Semfreda also did a number of psychiatric assessments, which found no mental abnormalities, as well as another TV hypnosis with a doctor who claimed that the guard was sincere, if deluded. On July 30th, 1979, seven months after his last abduction, Semfreda once again found himself lifted up in a beam of green light, this time from his new patrol route in the suburbs of Genoa. The rescue team responded immediately. They found his Vespa on top of a nearby mountain, and found Zemfreda two kilometers away running in complete darkness. There is only one narrow road to the mountain, and the guard there never saw Zemfreda pass by. Under hypnosis with Dr. Marchesan, Zemfreda claimed that the beings told him that they would return one last time when the great cold comes. At this point, they would give him the sphere and have him pass it along to an American professor whose name the guard recalled sounded something like Hanky. Marchesan asked if the beings had said Heineck, and Zemfreda agreed. Heineck was the world's foremost ufologist at the time, although Zemfreda didn't know him. Heineck received a full report on the case after visiting Genoa in 1984, although there's no indication that he ever received the sphere. Semfreda was abducted again on December 2nd, 1979. He said under hypnosis that a strange faceless man with an egg-shaped head approached him at a gas station. The man wore a checkered suit jacket over a silver turtleneck shirt, and acted as an intermediary between Semfreda and the tall green beings. Semfreda was ushered into the car, which was then engulfed in a cloud that carried him up to another room with the tall green beings inside. 
The room was massive and looked like a bustling city, and Zimfreda could see the earth as a ball in space outside a window. Here, Zimfreda was shown a number of large tubes containing a frog-like man, a caveman, and other humans suspended in blue liquid. Almok handed the sphere to Zimfreda, but the guard refused it and threw it back, smashing it on the ground, and the beings forced the helmet on his head. Meanwhile, Zimfreda's rescue team spotted a brilliant disc in the sky outside of Marzano, and two cars of guards drove to the scene. Twice, both vehicles died and restarted at the exact same time as they approached. They saw two large beams of light shining out from an unnaturally dense cloud and onto the ground in front of them. One of the guards fired two rounds at the source of the light, and the beams went out a few minutes later. The tall green beings acknowledged to Zimfreda the shots fired from the ground, despite apparently being in space. The beings showed Zimfreda a file of photos of everyone on Earth, imprinted with all their personal information. The beings claimed that all these people would eventually become subjects in their experiments, and that they'd return in due time with another sphere. The beings had told Zimfreda that they'd been in Spain the night before, scaring people in the streets. On December 4th, the Spanish press reported a story of a man being chased through the streets by a UFO that same night. Di Stefano found that farmers around Marzano had become almost desensitized to strange lights in the sky, and saw one that night as well. On February 12th, 1980, Zimfreda had his last widely publicized abduction. Under hypnosis, he explained that he felt compelled to enter his car and drive around for a while, before picking up the egg-headed man on the side of the highway. A bright light shone down from above, and the car braked by itself. The egg-headed man got out and entered the triangular craft hovering nearby, before it flew into a nearby ravine to avoid the coming rescue team. When rescue came, they found his car with the driver's side door open. Zemfreda was lying passed out on the edge of the ravine, and even after waking he was dazed and unresponsive. Monitoring equipment that Balbazano had installed on the car showed that the wheels had been lifted from the ground, and the thermometer had reached a maximum of 43 degrees Celsius. Magnetic tapes showed no sign of a magnetic field, and the photography equipment captured nothing unusual. While giving Zimfreda time to rest under hypnosis in his February 15th session, Dr. Moretti and Di Stefano suddenly heard the guards speaking an unknown language while apparently channeling another persona. When he did this, his face was uncharacteristically hard and stern, and his voice was strong. He said that the beings would come back soon to show themselves to all, but before that, they would only talk to Zemfreda, their intermediary. The channeling then ended abruptly. In different sessions, Zemfreda recalled vague memories of receiving the sphere in a box sometime in 1979, and hiding it in the mountains where he regularly checked up on it. He claimed that the sphere discharged electrical shocks, and that it pulsated brilliant light when the box was open. Once he claimed it cut a wild hair clean in half. Any further questions on the object or its whereabouts were stonewalled. Often, Zimfreda simply wouldn't respond. Moretti said that it was as if the guard had been counter-hypnotized, and instructed to deny all requests for more information on the sphere. Sometimes, however, Zemfreda would deny questions in his channeled voice. The channeled persona claimed that the guard's duty was to activate the sphere, which would allow the Dargos to land and make contact with 20 previously selected individuals. The landing never happened, however. Zemfreda had five more abduction experiences up until August 8, 1981, but Balbazano gave up on trying to understand them, and Di Stefano no longer published on them. The guard also went back for several more hypnosis sessions with Dr. Moretti, with the last one occurring on April 24, 1992, where he claimed the beings had said they were going to take the sphere back after all. Zemfreda's life was deeply changed by his experiences. In a little over a year, Zemfreda's dark black hair had turned completely grey, and was fully white a few years later. He put on 14 kilograms in 1979, and a co-worker remarked that he seemed to age two decades in about five years. 
Zamfretta urinated a black liquid after every encounter, and he experienced daily vomiting for the first year of his experiences. He had a headache and heard a hissing sound up to four days before abductions. He felt he'd been given a heavy burden by his visitors, and eagerly awaited the completion of his duties, which never seemed to come. The way that Zimfreda was targeted as a chosen intermediary in a series of entity encounters is reminiscent of religious narratives of contact with angels and Marian apparitions. Zimfreda was informed of his role through the progressive revelation of information over many short encounters, even though very little information was revealed in each one. This is similar to the progressive revelation of the Fatima apparitions, or the Lady of Lourdes, France, who made revelations to Bernadette Subiru over 18 separate appearances. Contactees since the mid-1950s, widely ridiculed for their alleged contacts with higher beings, also claim to be visited repeatedly, and they're often warned of the dangers of nuclear arms. Though there's evidence that Zemfreda's experiences were at least partly real in a physical sense, there are also elements of the story that seem to defy physics, logic, and common sense. Zimfreda reported that the inside of the Dargo's craft was much larger than the exterior of the ship would allow for, and it appeared to be in space, even when the other guards could see its lights from the ground. Many other abductees, including those abducted at Pascagoula in 1973, also said that the interior of their captor's craft was much larger than it was outside. Much of what the Dargos said was highly imprecise, and full of internal contradictions. The Dargos claimed to be from the Third Galaxy, an absurdly vague description, and Almak contradicted himself in the different reasons he gave for visiting Earth. And none of them turned out to be true, as the Dargos apparently never built a city, never established contact, and never had Zemfreda prepare a landing. The Dargos also changed their minds three times on the issue of the Sphere, first claiming it should go to Hynek, then claiming it would be hidden until the landing, and finally deciding to take it back. It was first introduced as a kind of TV, and then as a device to prepare for a landing. And of course, only Zimfreda saw the beings, despite the fact that they repeatedly exclaimed their desire to make contact with humanity. The level of absurdity, and the fact that Zimfreda could recall nothing of his experiences in a normal waking state, leads one to think that the phenomenon was at least partly mental or psychic in nature, or that parts of it took place in some constructed, alternate reality or altered state of consciousness. Di Stefano published a book in 1984 recounting all of Zimfreda's experiences that was updated and translated into English in 2014. He retired professionally but continues to write. Zimfreda has remained a minor celebrity in Italy and abroad, attending the World Congress on Ufology in Tucson, Arizona in 1991. As of 2017, he's still true to his story. He still believes that one day, people will see that it's true. <laughs>